their affiliated militias reach is vast and highly detrimental. We need to empower our intelligence professionals to counter them. And finally, the Secretary of State should focus on Iraq in the same way that Secretary Kerry so brilliantly focused on Afghanistan to put together the unity government. That kind of diplomatic attention will signal to Iraq and to its allies and its enemies the seriousness of our approach. So in sum, these four steps with their component reforms, defining our political end state and agreeing on it, enabling political reforms, conditioning further military support on political progress, and providing authorization and funding for Iraq's future are vital to Iraq's success. Now, what I have proposed here is not easy. Put another way, it's really hard. Many of us will hear this and again wish we had never gone into Iraq in the first place. For some, it is tempting to say that because the invasion was a mistake, we should try to leave again and never come back. But frankly, we have tried that, and it's what has delivered us to where we are today. I believe that the plan I've presented, while difficult, time-consuming, and not without risk, is the best option we have. And ultimately, it will be less difficult, less time-consuming, and less risky, and importantly, less costly than any other option before us today, including our present course. Now, confident that there will be many, I would be delighted to take the questions. Thank you, Congressman. Um, and as I said in my introduction, you know, you come from a position of significant credibility, having served four tours in Iraq and seen it from the ground perspective uh, in so many different ways. And you lay out a very compelling vision. Um, I know that uh, many of us have been concerned uh, that there be a, a more complete strategic framework going forward. Um, I am particularly interested in uh, your emphasis on the need to ensure that we have uh, the, the, the political, the diplomatic resources on the ground. And I guess two questions for you, particularly now from your current seat on the Hill, uh, and that is, you know, one of the constraints is the inability, even if they were there, for our diplomatic and development professionals to actually move about, mm -hmm. um, given the high risk adverse uh, environment uh, and their constrained uh, presence uh, to just inside the embassies. Right. What, do you see that changing anytime soon, particularly to carry out such an urgent mission as you've outlined? Well, I think there are two main issues here. I mean, one is just simply State Department policy. And, and, I, and I think, I mean, from my time in Iraq, I, the State Department is incredibly risk averse. And frankly, you know, I, I don't get political here, but like the Benghazi situation makes this a lot worse. I, mean, I, I think we should be praising Ambassador Stevens for getting out there and doing his job, even that the, though we undertook some risks to do so. And yet, instead, we seem to have this expectation that ambassadors should live behind blast walls and never even meet the people they're supposed to work with. So it is a tricky political environment to make those changes, but ultimately I do think that the State Department should operate in a much more expeditionary way. But the second issue is, you know, comes back to uh, the MOU of sorts that I'm saying that we need to formalize with the Iraqi government. Because if we don't have the ability to protect our diplomats, you know, I'm not talking about an, a, a sizable military presence. I am talking about having security personnel to d protect these diplomats when they necessarily leave the green zone um, or operate out of other bases in Iraq, which I think we probably should have, um, you know, political, diplomatic outposts, right? They need to have protection, and we need to facilitate that. And so that's why, while no one wants to talk about any sort of MOU, because both to Americans and to Iraqis, they don't like the idea of formalizing any sort of long-term presence, the reality is to, to, to simply do this job, it's necessary, and it's much better to negotiate it now and take it off the table for the future than to have to constantly face this issue every time they need a little bit more help. 
And if I may, before we open it up, one more question for you, and that is, um, uh, y you know, you talk about the need for a political or an integrated political military strategy so we don't have to keep returning the troops. We are, by all accounts, on the eve of moving into Mosul. Um, what do you think would still be possible or what is necessary uh, to accompany th that military uh, push to ensure that we don't just leave it to the possibility of renewed cycles of conflict? Well, I was last in Iraq in uh, July, and <laughs> you know, the, the basic question is, hey, how are things going for the day after? What is the plan? What is the American plan? What is the Iraqi plan for the day after? It sounds like that. That's, <laughs> that's, that's the answer. So that's a real concern. So everybody is anxious to get going on Mosul. Everyone greets it as positive news, wonderful news, that, that we might actually be ahead of timeline with going in. I actually think it's bad news. I think that we've got to use the remaining leverage we have to get some political progress. And at the same time, or in the meantime, let's figure out what we are going to do the day after we win over the city. If you look at the cities that have been won over, Ramadi, Fallujah, name a couple, uh, and look carefully at how those cities are being you know, governed today, it's not an encouraging picture. You know, one of the fundamental questions that we should be asking is, are the Sunnis who live in Ramadi and Fallujah, again, just to pick two cities that are sort of prominent in American imagination, are, are they happier with the Iraqi government now that the Iraqi government has returned and ISIS has been kicked out? Because if we're, if we're doing, if we have any chance of long-term success, We've got to see their support for the government go way up. Because ultimately, we're all saying that, hey, everyone's happy that we're liberated from ISIS. But the thing that got us to having ISIS in those towns in the first place is the fact that people were so upset with the Iraqi government that many of them welcomed ISIS in. Mm -hmm. I have yet to see any evidence that Sunni popular opinion of the Iraqi government has improved. So they may be thrilled to get rid of ISIS. They may be thrilled to have ISIS gone. But if fundamentally we're not building any trust with legitimate Iraqi authorities, then, then we're just back where we started. And of course, we have the additional complexity of, of a multifaceted minority population in the Mosul Oh, absolutely. Mo Mosul well, is really 10 times more complicated. <laughs> right. 10 times more complicated. And, uh, you know, and that, it should be a strength of Mosul that it's multi-ethnic, multi-sectarian. I mean, you know, if you can make a government work in, in Mosul, it sort of almost by, you know, by default has to uh, uh, encompass minority views. But the reality is that for that immediate post-conflict planning that has to take place, it's, it's complicated. It's hard. What, one of the things that I heard on my last trip to Iraq is, you know, the Iranians play the long game. Mm -hmm. You Americans don't. And so, how do you see building the kind of consensus that we need to enable that kind of sustained engagement? We know this is not going to be done like this. Right. No, look, it is very unpopular to, to, to do what I'm doing right now, to be an American politician saying we should have a sustained engagement in a place like Iraq, because all of us just want to come home, whether you're someone that supported the war or you're someone that was adamantly against it. I mean, pretty much everyone just says, let's get out of there. So, the reality, though, is that the alternative, which is we go back every five years to clean up the same mess, is worse, putting our troops in danger again. We now have upwards of 5,000 troops in Iraq under the president who campaigned on a promise to pull us out. So President Obama has tried this. Mm -hmm. And there's been no one politically more committed to getting us out of Iraq than President Obama. He was elected largely on that platform. Under Obama himself, we've had to go back in. So my biggest fear is that we just get in this endless cycle of going back, refighting the same battles, put, putting more young Americans at risk for the same things that we already risked lives for in the past. I think that framing it that way to the American public is what's necessary. And I can tell you, just as a uh, representative, when I go and talk to my constituency in Massachusetts, you know, not the bastion of conservative Trumpdom in America, there are a lot of people who say, when are we going to get out? You know, some people who say, 
Afghanistan, for example. I mean, Afghanistan is our longest war. When are we going to get the troops home? I say, look, we can bring them home tomorrow. But if we do that, be prepared to send them back five years from now, because that's exactly what we did in Iraq. And I'll tell you what, when you say that, there are a lot of reluctant nodding heads in the room. They don't like it. I wish we could come up with a better solution, a better answer. But it's preferable to have a long-term diplomatic presence so we can actually make this work mm -hmm. than having to keep sending the troops back. Um, I want to open it up for questions. I know there are a lot of people here who have deep engagement with Iraq. Uh, and we have mics coming around. Thank you very much, Congressman. Alexander Kravitz from Insight Iraq. I, um, I, I have to say that in this current environment of you know, almost non-dialogue and polarization, it's frankly like a breath of fresh air to listen to a member of Congress with really thoughtful and knowledgeable proposals. And I think even if I disagreed with you on some ideas, I would say like this is really like a breath of fresh air. As it is, I don't disagree. I think you're absolutely spot on. So I was thinking, you know, what, uh, uh, what, what could one maybe add or ask and uh, to, to pick up on um, uh, uh, Nancy Lindbergh asked some of the questions that I wanted to ask, but what about something that might sound pie in the sky? What about helping to secure visas to Iraqis? I don't mean refugee visas. I don't mean, uh, you know, political uh, SIV visas, but just tourism visas. I've been surprised in my conversations with Iraqis, you know, the desire to come and visit, I mean, to just see the U.S. And one doesn't really think, you know, with the whole security thing about, you know, Iraqi tourists coming to America, but what would you think of perhaps an initiative like that? Well, I, I'm not sure. I mean, it may, be a, it may be a good idea. I'm not sure it gets just the sort of heart of the problem in, a, in, a, in Iraq today that we have to, uh, that we have to address. Uh, I'm a big supporter of the SIV legislation. Uh, I uh, led the amendment in the House to keep um, the SIV program alive in the uh, defense bill uh, for, for our Afghan translators. Um, I was actually just talking to Senator McCain about this uh, last week. He's a Republican who's leading uh, the effort along with uh, Gene Shaheen in the Senate to keep it in. Um, so I understand the importance of, of, of these programs and whatnot. And, and as you mentioned, there's value in tourism as well. Uh, but I'm not sure that's sort of the, the, the heart of the issue. I mean, ultimately, we have to make sure uh, that Iraqis feel confident in their own government and that they want to stay and happily live in Iraq. Thank you. So we have a whole extra overflow room um, that, uh, of people who are listening. So I want to make sure Thank that you. their questions uh, get asked. Great. And so let me ask both of these to you, and you can okay. take them both at once. The first is, how do we enforce conditions on military support and arms sales, as you suggest, without pushing Iraq towards Iran or other countries that would provide that support without condition? Mm -hmm. And then secondly is, what kind of integration or expectation of allied forces would you see in implementing your four-part plan? OK. Uh, so the Two first question. Excellent questions. Uh, you know, the, the answer to the first question, frankly, is it's, it's hard. I mean, you have to strike the, 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 the right balance. You have to be savvy diplomats here. Uh, I, you know, Iraqis prefer American material. American, um, I mean, everyone knows that we have the best weapons and equipment. Uh, Iraqis, from personal experience, strongly prefer that. Um, so there is a preference there that we, can, uh, that we can leverage. But if we just go in and say, OK, we're shutting off all supplies, you know, that's not smart either. So we have to be able to find, you know, to, to work a balance here. Uh, but it's but it's doable, and uh, General Petraeus and Ambassador Crocker did it during the surge. I did it as uh, a captain on the ground working with Iraqi units, uh, where um, we would, you know, the Iraqi police and army units that we were working with uh, would want weapons, ammunition, and whatnot, and we would often say, okay, well, you meet these requirements, you, know, you get this done, uh, you account for these things, you account for these personnel, and then you'll get this. Uh, so. Uh, from personal experience, but also from past experience, you can do this. The questioner is correct that it is it is a tricky balance that we have to strike. Um, and then the the role.